Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I realize in listening to that introduction, you're thinking, why in the world is he speaking on Peter? Uh, and I'm wondering the same. Uh, but, uh, I'm grateful to be here this morning at this very symposium. Uh, Peter does have a strong connection, of course, as you, as you all know, to the Restoration. And uh, that's the approach we'll take in this session uh, this morning. Um, I'm grateful that you're here, and I hope we have an enjoyable hour together. Uh, this picture, of course, uh, this picture portrays uh, is, is an image of uh, the portrayal of uh, Dante's experience with uh, Virgil as they descend into the abyss uh, in, the infer- in, the, in, this, in Dante's uh, work, class of work, The Inferno. It begins, You do not question what souls these are that suffer here before you, the poet Virgil asked Dante, as they encounter their first spirits while beginning the descent. I wish you to know before you travel that these travel on that these were sinless, Virgil continued, and still their merits fail, for they lack baptism's grace, which is the door of the true faith you were born to. Their birth fell before the age of the Christian mysteries, and so they did not worship God's trinity in fullest duty. I am one of these, Virgil lamented, for such defects are we lost. This fate of souls lacking baptism's grace appears to have troubled Dante as it has plagued many others who grapple with the Savior's firm degree to, firm degree to, firm decree to Nicodemus. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. Pained by the thought of the many worthy souls who suffer, Dante questioned if anything could be done for those souls whose merits fail. The poet continued, Instruct me, Master and Most Noble Sir. Has any by his own or another's merit gone ever from this place to blessedness? He sensed my inner question and answered it, Dante observed. I was still new to this estate of tears when a mighty one descended here among us. Crowned with the sign of his victorious years, Virgil responded. He took from us the shade of our first parent, of Abel, his pure son, of ancient Noah, of Moses, the bringer of law, the obedient, Father Abraham, David the king, Israel with his father and his children, Rachel, the holy vessel of his blessing, and many more he chose for elevation among the elect. And before these, you must know, no human soul had ever won salvation. The truth that a mighty one descended to the spirit world and act with the the righteous dead on a mission to save souls does not originate with the late medieval poet Dante. However fragmented his romanticized account may appear, the motif of Christ reaching beyond the veil is a partially preserved verbalization of earlier Christian teachings all of which are a heritage of the writings and ministry of the Apostle Peter. In 1 Peter 3.19, as you all know, he taught that Christ, quote, went and preached unto the spirits in prison, end quote. Additionally, Peter both held and conferred priesthood keys relative to salvation. The influence of Peter's participation in the restoration of God's priesthood authority on earth, coupled with the prompting and prophetic insight brought about by his teachings, have laid the groundwork for our understanding of salvation for the dead. They remain a modern legacy of Peter, the chief apostle. The study of salvation is rooted in the teachings of Jesus Christ and the power granted in his hand to perform actions on earth that would, that would impact one's status in heaven. Jesus instructed Nicodemus that being born again, being born again both of water and the spirit, coupled with belief in him, are required for entrance into God's kingdom and eternal life. Latter-day Saints connect an eternal reward to deeds done while in the life through Christ's declaration. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. A call to the apostleship, Peter was charged to preach the kingdom of God, including the doctrines of faith, repentance, and rebirth, necessary for salvation. Boldly declaring his personal witness that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, he was promised the keys of the kingdom including power that whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Six days following that promise, the promise was fulfilled. Matthew records, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them, the account continues, after which Peter summarized, Lord, it is good for us to be here. While the New Testament record is unclear regarding all that occurred on the Mount of Transfiguration, Latter-day Saints scripture and prophetic teachings add important insight. The Doctrine and Covenants reveals 
that we, quote, have not yet received a full account of what occurred there. Later, Joseph Smith taught that, it, that the Savior, Moses, and Elias gave the keys to Peter, James, and John on the mount when they were transfigured before him. From a Latter-day Saint perspective, these keys authorized the apostles to administer the preaching of the gospel throughout the world and, for the sake of the topic at hand, perform ordinances that would, it, that would have impact beyond the veil for most of the living in the day. Broadening the benefits of what occurred on the Mount of Transfiguration to those whom Peter had reached because of the experience, one Latter-day Saint scholar wrote, We are persuaded that the happenings on the Mount of Transfiguration are among the most important in the entire New Testament. The events matter because Latter-day Saints believe that priesthood authority is essential. Armed with the teachings of salvation and the power to make its ordinances efficacious beyond the grave, Peter boldly pursued his mission to lead the church and save the children of men following Christ's resurrection. The book of Acts records Peter's powerful teachings, confident declarations, and prophetic guidance in a nearly two-decade-long Mediterranean ministry. <coughs> Furthermore, his understanding of Christ's post-mortal ministry to the spirits in prison is preserved, is preserved in the first general epistle of Peter, likely authored in the early 60s from Rome, to the saints of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. In it, Peter revealed, quote, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Speaking of the purposes of his master's ministry in the spirit world, Peter continued, For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them in their day, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. In these passages, Peter adds additional insight to Christ's earlier declaration recorded in, recorded in the Gospel of John. Quote, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Taken literally, and when read through the lens of modern revelation, the passages and the concept they convey appear to be quite clear. Christ went in spirit to preach to the spirits in prison. The implication of that interpretation, however, have led to a variety of readings, especially when considered without the help of modern scripture. Indeed, the difficulty does not actually lie in the passage, Professor and Catherine Thomas observed, but in the minds of the interpreters who find a conflict here with their own views of the afterlife and the impossibility of progress or redemption there. For example, writing specifically of 1 Peter 3.19, Martin Luther declared, that is as strange a text and as dark a saying as any in the New Testament, so that I am not yet sure what St. Peter intended. New Testament scholar Paul J. Ackmeyer summarized, this verse is one of the shorter, but surely the most problematic in the letter, if not in the entire New Testament canon as a whole and eludes any agreement on its precise meaning. Expounding on the problems the, passages create, the passage creates, Hackmeyer continues, there are the questions of the identity of the spirits, and the place of and reason for their imprisonment, the direction of Christ's journey, whether it was an ascent or a descent, and the time it occurred, and the content of his proclamation. Importantly, many of these questions were answered in modern revelation sparked by a reading of the first few. Challenged by the notion of disembodied spirits in prison and post-death repentance, modern scholars have sought for other interpretations to the teachings of Peter regarding Christ's ministry to the dead. One option ties the teaching of preaching to the time of Noah, implying that Christ, quote, Christ preached by the Holy Spirit through the lips of Noah to the wicked generation that lived before the, before the flood, end quote. Another applies the passage to speak to the power and reach of Christ, quote, demonstrating that if the crucified and risen Christ preached to them, evil, evil as they were, then not even death can put the most egregious sinner beyond the reach of Christ's saving power. Such preaching to Noah's generation is thus an example of a larger truth, the reading continues, namely that those who died in the time, in the time before Christ, or those who died without a chance for faith in him, are not beyond the reach of salvation, end quote. A third interpretation is that Peter's message was a call to the saints of his day to stand firm in their fearless confession and have the courage to tell even the most resolute sinners what hope in Christ means. <coughs> The content of 1 Peter 4, 6 is likewise problematic for modern scholars. In an interpretation that ultimately resonates with modern scripture on the subject, Ockmeyer continues, there is no indication in this verse that Christ is the one doing the preaching. He is more likely to be the subject matter 
than the agent of the preaching mentioned in the verse. Turning attention on the dead to whom the gospel is preached, some apply the message to mean that the gospel is preached not to, quote, those who have died physically, but to those who are spiritually dead, end quote. Though, again, this reconciliation is problematic, in part because of the context of final judgment implied in 1 Peter 4. Attempting to reconcile these inconsistencies, Ockmeyer notes, quote, if they, had prior, if they had died prior to hearing the gospel, it would have to mean the gospel is preached then in the realm of the dead. Yet any notion of disembodied souls in Hades is a view of the afterlife quite absent from the New Testament. Furthermore, it would clearly imply that there is a possibility of repentance and conversion after death, again an idea quite, a, quite foreign to the text. These possibilities were encountered to Christian thought, non-Latter-day Saint scholars um, surmise. E.M. Blakelock writes, quote, It is impossible to support repentance after this life by any other passage of Scripture. And the whole weight of the New Testament is against the possibility that any who, cannot, who consciously reject Christ in this life have, have any opportunity to reconsider their choice in another. Peter himself would recruit me again. Though confusing because of its doctrinal implications for, for modern Christianity, the first century teaching of Peter that Christ's mission included literal service, service to those beyond the veil is perpetuated in early Christian thought. Among them, Irenaeus declared, the Lord descended into the regions beyond the veil, beneath the earth, preaching his advent there also, and declaring the remission of sins received by those who believe in him. Origen likewise taught, we assert that not only while Jesus was in the body did he win over not a few persons namely, but also that when he became a soul, without the covering of the body, he dwelt among those souls which were without bodily covering, converting such of them as were willing to himself. Though this was a teaching of the Christian, uh, though this was a teaching of the Christian ancient, of the chief ancient apostle, held strongly by major Christian teachers for some centuries, the meaning of Peter's teaching is now largely misunderstood. It was into this void of understanding that the restoration was born. Importantly, it was Peter and his teachings on Christ's mission and spirits in prison that sparked Latter-day Saint understanding of salvation for the dead. Peter's role in shaping modern understanding of salvation for the dead is rooted in his participation in seminal events of the Restoration, as Ella Hayford highlighted last night in his, in his talk. For Joseph Smith, this connection to Peter was personal, as it was with others of, the ancient prophetic, others of his ancient prophetic counterparts. Describing the prophet's interactions with Peter and other scriptural luminaries, President John Taylor thought, when Joseph Smith was raised up as a prophet of God, Mormon, Moroni, Nephi, and others of the ancient prophets who formerly lived on this continent, and Peter and John and others who lived on the Asiatic continent, came to him and communicated to him certain principles pertaining to the gospel of the Son of God. Why? Because they held the keys to the various dispensations and conferred them upon him and he upon us. The earliest recorded reference to Peter in this dispensation comes from an April 1829 revelation to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowden, when they inquired concerning the fate of John, the beloved, and as described in the last chapter of the Gospel of John. Informed that John had tarried on the earth, the account turned next to Peter, revealing that he would, quote, minister for John and for thy brother James, and unto you three I will give this power and the keys of this ministry until I come, end quote. A month later, Peter's possessing the, the keys of salvation is reiterated in the account of the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood, when John the Baptist appeared, announcing, quote, the, that he acted under the direction of Peter, James, and John, who held the keys of the priesthood of Melchizedek, which priesthood, he said, would in due time be confirmed. While no corresponding section exists chron chronicling the actual conferral of the Melchizedek priesthood, like one does for the Aaronic priesthood, two later accounts testify to its occurrence. In a September 1830 revelation, the Lord spoke of Joseph Smith's encounter, quote, with Peter and James and John, with whom I have sent, whom I have sent unto you, by whom I have ordained you, and conferred, confirmed you to be apostles and special witnesses of my name, and bear the keys of your ministry, and done the same things which were revealed unto them. Continuing, the Lord emphasized the place of priesthood keys prominent in this experience, as well as Peter's role in possessing those keys, quote, unto whom I have committed the keys of pre the place of priesthood keys. It took, I have committed the keys of my kingdom and the dispensation of the gospel for the last times and for the fullness of time. More than a decade later, the prophet himself gave a description of the experience. Quote, 
And again, what do we hear? The voice of Peter, James, and John in the wilderness in Harmony, said Susquehanna County, and Colesville, Broome County, on the Susquehanna River, declaring themselves as possessing the keys of the kingdom and of the dispensation of the fullness of time. In addition to the passing of priesthood keys, Peter was personally involved in the events that laid the groundwork for the exercising of those keys on behalf of the dead. In his account of the current dedication of the Kirtland Temple, the prophet recorded in his journal, President Williams arose and testified that while President Reagan was making his first prayer, an angel entered the window and took him and, and seated himself between Father Smith and himself and remained there during his prayer. Um, here's the pulpits of the Kirtland Temple. You can see that the window in the center at the top is the window that's being described. Uh, President uh, and Joseph Smith Sr. seated at the very top, President Reagan on one side, President uh, uh, Frank Williams on the other, and Peter comes through that window and seats himself between them. President Heber C. Kimball, their tritrimonal angel, later added, when the afternoon meeting assembled, Joseph, feeling very much elated, arose the first thing and said the personage who appeared in the morning was the angel Peter, come to accept the dedication. President Heber C. Kimball even gave a description of Peter's appearance. Quote, they had a fair view of his person. He was a very tall personage, black eyes, white hair, and stooped shoulders. His garment was whole, extending to near his ankles, and on his feet he had sandals. He was sent as a messenger to accept the dedication. This and other experiences seem to be the basis for John Taylor's praise of the prophet. Quote, if you were to ask Joseph what sort of looking man Adam was, he would tell you at once. He would tell you his size, appearance, and all about him. You might have asked him what sort of men Peter, James, and John were, and he could have told you. Why? Because he had seen them. Peter's participation in the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood and the dedication of the Kirtland Temple were preparatory to the bestowal of priesthood keys on Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in the Kirtland Temple on April 3, 1836, a week following the building's dedication. While there, while there is no indication that Peter participated with the Savior, Moses, Elias, and Elijah on the occasion, the event certainly mirrored Peter's own receipt of the keys, and the keys on the Mount of Transfiguration 18 centuries earlier. As they had been given to Peter anciently, these powers were likewise given through Peter and others of his ancient prophetic counterparts in the last days. While Peter interacted with Joseph Smith and others of the early church in restoring the keys to the Melchizedek priesthood, the shaping influence of his writings had more recently impacted the latter day understanding of salvation for the day. The, uh, the prophet Joseph Smith, for his part, had an, had an appreciation for and affinity with the writings of Peter. As he once observed, Peter penned the most sublime, sublime language of any of the apostles. While Joseph Smith was drawn to the style of writing in 1st and 2nd Peter, he was the prophet's nephew and sixth president of the church, Joseph F. Smith, for whom Peter's words were the springboard into an understanding of redemption for the dead. Joseph F. Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead, of the dead was received on October 3rd, 1918, the day before the beginning of the annual semi annual general conference of the church and a mere six weeks before President Smith's own death. Scholars have carefully analyzed the historical context of Joseph F. Smith's vision, acknowledging the influence of the terrible loss of life associated with both World War I and the worldwide flu epidemic that gripped society, global society at the time of its reception. In the Great War, more than nine million soldiers and countless legions of civilians perished in the battlefields, battleships, and bombed out byways, with another 21 million wounded. Overshadowing those lost to armed conflict, the worldwide influenza epidemic that erupted on the war's heels claimed between 20 and 100 million globally from 1918 to 1920, including nearly 700,000 Americans. For the church, the outbreak led to the cancellation of President Smith's own public funeral in November 1918 and the postponement of the April General Conference the next year. Authors have also connected the vision of the personal loss of life in President Smith's own family stretching back as far as his father, Hiram Smith, who died when young Joseph was only five years old, and his mother, Mary Fielding, who died when he was 13. They have discussed the loss of several of his children from the passing of his firstborn, Mercy Josephine, who died in 1870 at the age of three, to, most immediately before the revelation, the sudden demise of his firstborn son, 45-year-old apostle Hiram Max Smith, who died of complications from a rupture of appendix in January 1918 nine months before the vision. Speaking in a temple meeting just weeks after his son's death, President Smith summarized, I ought certainly to have charity for those who, for others who suffer and who are tried. 
For I lost my father when I was but a child. I lost my mother, the sweetest soul that ever lived, when I was only a boy. I have buried one of the loveliest wives that ever blessed the lot of me. And I have buried 13 of my more than 40 children that the Lord gave me. And it has seemed to me that the most promising, the most hopeful, and if possible, the sweetest and purest and the best have been the earliest called to rest. Surely I have been touched and humbled with all these things and others, the death of my kindred, brothers and sisters, the passing away from me that I love with all my soul. Indeed, death had surrounded him throughout his life, one author wrote, and the longings these deaths awakened could not be fully soothed in mortality. Additionally, scholars have examined the proliferation of addresses by President Smith from the top of life after death in the years leading up to his 1918 vision. Beginning with his April 1916 general conference address entitled In the Presence of the Divine, and including his February 1918 temple meeting address entitled The Status of Little Children in the Resurrection, President Smith experienced an era of unusual spiritual enlightenment in which he delivered to the church some of the most important and inspiring events, of, inspiring insights of his dispensation. These experiences reaching their climax immediately prior to the receiving of the October 1918 vision may explain President Smith's own words as he addressed the Civil General Conference audience in his, in his opening session, somewhat spontaneously, but we're not expecting him to, to attend General Conference nor to participate. And this was his opening paragraph. I will not, I dare not, attempt to enter upon many things that are resting upon my mind this morning, and I shall postpone until some future time, the Lord being willing, my attempt to tell you some of the things that are in my mind and that dwell in my heart. I have not lived alone these five things. I have dwelt in the spirit of prayer, of supplication, of faith, and of determination. And I have had my communications with the, Lord, with the spirit of the Lord continues. While all of these contextual details are important to appreciating Joseph's this vision, context does not necessarily imply causality. George S. Tate, one commentator, commentator on, on Smith's vision, lies in the It is problematic, he continued when context mistakenly gets treated as the determinant of something, rather than as the framework. In this regard, President Smith's declaration of his vision of the redemption of the dead importantly attributes, causa attributes causa causality to only one thing, his ponderings on the writings of the Apostle Peter. Quote, on the 3rd of October, in the year 1918, I sat in my room pondering over the scriptures and reflecting upon the great atonement sacrifice that was made by the Son of God for the redemption of people. President Smith declared in a message written immediately following the church's October General Conference. Turning to the teachings of the Chief Apostle, President Smith continued, While I was thus engaged, my mind reverted to the writings of the Apostle Peter, to the printing of saints scattered abroad throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and other parts of Asia, where the gospel was preached after the crucifixion of the Lord. I opened the Bible and read the third and fourth chapters of the first epistle. And as I read, I was greatly impressed, more than I ever had been before. Summarizing the role Peter's writings played as a gateway to the divine, Smith recounted, as I pondered over these things which are written, the eyes of my understanding were opened, and the spirit of the Lord rested upon me, and I saw the most simple, the most small of The 1918 vision of President Smith was not the first time he referenced the writings of Peter in public discourse. For example, the Journal of Discourses contains at least seven different sermons by President Smith, where he references 1 Peter 3 or 1 Peter 4, the earliest from 1875, more than four years before the vision. Quote, Jesus himself preached the gospel to the spirits in prison, Smith repeatedly emphasized in the addresses, while his body slept in the tomb, themes that were later expanded upon and clarified in the 1838. As president of the church, Smith turned the text into a 1912 funeral sermon, for Sister Mary A. Freeze, a leader in the Church's Mutual Improvement Association. On that occasion, he announced, I have always believed, and still do believe, with all, my, with all my soul, that such men as Peter and James, and the twelve disciples chosen and saved in his time, have been, have been engaged all centuries that have passed since their martyrdom for the testimony of Jesus Christ, in proclaiming liberty to the captives of the spirit of and in opening their prison doors. I do not believe that they could be employed in any greater work. Their mission is to save men. Their special calling and anointing of the Lord himself was to save the world, to, pay, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison doors to those who are bound in chains of darkness, to 
superstition, and ignorance. Expanding the thought to include those of his own dispensation, Smith continued, I believe that the disciples who have passed away in this dispensation, Joseph the prophet, and his brother Hyrule, and Brigham, and Heber, and Willard, and Daniel, and John, and Wilford, and all the rest of the prophets that have lived in this dispensation, and that have been intimately associated with the work of redemption and the other ordinances of the gospel of the Son of God in this world, are preaching that same gospel that they lived and preached here to those who are in darkness and spirit world, and who have not had the knowledge before they went. Both beliefs were confirmed in Texas and Smith's own vision. The vision of the redemption of the dead, as section 138 has come to be known, answered questions long presented by Peter's earlier writings on this subject, both corroborating, corroborating and expanding Texas Smith's earlier teachings. One of the fundamental questions and answers is who the Savior visited. President Smith noted that he saw assembled, quote, an innumerable company of the spirits of the just, who had been faithful to the testimony of Jesus while they lived in mortality, and who had offered sacrifice in the similitude of the great sacrifice of the Son of God, and had suffered tribulation in their Redeemer's name. All these have departed the Lord for mortal life, firm in the hope of the glorious resurrection, through the grace of God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. The description of a visit to the just and faithful dead who had departed mortality firm in their faith stands in stark contrast to Peter's initial description, which noted that Christ, quote, when he preached to the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Peter's version of the visit creates potential questions in the minds of those who read it literally. Why would Christ choose to visit spirits in prison, and among them specifically the disobedient from the days of Noah? Smith's vision helps with these questions in at least two ways. First, it acknowledges that even among the most righteous spirits, which include the likes of Adam, Eve, Abel, Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Elias, Malachi, and prophets who have who have dwelt among the Levites, there was need for deliverance. Quote, the dead had looked upon the long absence of their spirits from their bodies as a bondage. Smith wrote. Satisfying in one sense, Peter's description that Christ went to the spirits of prison. According to this view, individuals must long for, quote, the spirit and the body to be united, never again to be divided, that they might receive the fullness of joy. <coughs> Secondly, the vision of the redemption of the dead clarifies that unto the wicked Christ did not. And among the ungodly and unrepentant who had defiled themselves while in the flesh, his voice was not raised. Wondering at the words of Peter on the subject, where he said that the Son of God preached on the spirits in prison, who sometimes were disobedient once the long suffering of God lived in the days of night, and how it was possible for him to preach to those spirits and form a necessary labor among them in so short a time, President Smith learned that rather than ministering in person among the wicked and the disobedient who had rejected the truth, the Lord instead organized his forces and appointed messengers, clothed with power and authority, and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them who were in darkness even to all the spirits of men, and thus was the gospel preached to the dead. In this way, Christ evidenced a depth of, a depth of concern, so great that even the generation of rejected worlds, but did so for the, the ministry of faithful saints commissioned to represent. The idea that individuals other than Christ ministered among the wicked in the spirit world was an important addition to Peter's teachings, clarifying commonly held understandings among even Latter-day Saints as well as presses to his own earlier teachings. For example, in his classic, Jesus the Christ, published a mere three years before the vision, James E. Talmadge wrote, quote, while divested of his body, quote, of his body, Christ ministered among the departed, both in paradise and in the prison room, where it dwelt in a state of glory as the spirits of the disobedient. Commenting specifically on Peter's reference to the disobedient in Noah's day, Talmadge surmised, we are not to assume that Peter's illustrative mention of the disobedient antediluvians, that they alone were included in the blessed opportunities offered to Christ in the spirit world. On the contrary, we conclude in reason and consistency that all whose wickedness in the flesh had brought the spirits into the present house were shared in the possibility of expiation, repentance, and release. While Joel's Smith's vision clearly states that the latter is true, namely that spirits in prison have a possibility of expiation, repentance, and release, the knowledge regarding which individuals deliver the message changes because of the sense of its vision. 
The vision of the redemption of the dead also expands, expands upon a slight Joseph Smith translation change in one of the verses of 1 Peter. While the King James Version of 1 Peter 4 reports, well, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them in their day, Joseph Smith's translation of the same verse modifies it to me, because of this is the gospel preached to the dead in day. The changing of the preaching of the, to the dead from the past was to the present is receives explanation in the latter revision. Presumably, the teaching by prophets among the rebellious occurred after the brief time of preparation conducted by the Savior and continues today. Transitioning to work in the spirit world in his own time, President Smith wrote, I beheld that the faithful elders of this dispensation, when they depart from more than life, continue their labors in the preaching of the gospel of repentance and revelation through the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God among those who embark this and under the bondage of sin the great world of the spirits of God. Finally, the vision of the redemption of the dead clarifies the message taught in the world of spirits. Earlier, Peter really declared that the teaching would include, quote, the gospel. To that reason, President Smith adds, quote, these were taught faith in God, repentance from sin, vicarious doctrines of the remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Ghost by laying on hands, and all other principles of the gospel that were necessary for them to know in order to qualify themselves, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Therefore, the vision held out hope for redemption on conditions of repentance, even among the dead. Quote, the dead who repent will be redeemed through obedience to the ordinances of the house of God, President Smith wrote, concluding the vision. After they have paid the penalty of their transgressions and are washed clean, shall receive a reward according to their works, for they are heirs of salvation. In this sense, President, vision, President Smith's vision adds important, important insights to Peter's earlier teaching. Not only is the gospel preached to those who died in their sins without knowledge of the truth, it is also preached to those in transgression, having rejected the prophets. It is also preached in offering both groups a, a means for redemption. Commenting on these verses, President James E. Faust noted the careful wording of the passages and their doctrinal implications. Mercy will not rob justice in time, and the seed and power of faithful parents will only hold wayward children, only on the condition of their repentance in Christ's atonement. Repentant wayward children will enjoy salvation and all the blessings that go with them. But exaltation is much more. It must be fully earned. The question as to who will be exalted must be left to the Lord as we some of you may know that Elder Bednar wrote an article in the Enzyme last March on this, on this very subject. For this reason, in addition to clarifying misinterpretations of the past, President Smith's message, drawn from the words of Peter, stands as a supreme message. In conclusion, if Peter was pleased with the dedication of the Kirkland Temple, one can only wonder how he must feel about the influence he has had on the latter day same understanding of salvation for the dead. Anciently, his teachings influenced early Christian thought regarding the post-mortal ministry of Christ in the spirit world. In our day, his restoring of the priesthood authority paved the way for those teachings on salvation of the dead to be applied. Furthermore, Peter's sublime words led Joseph F. Smith, one of the greatest doctrinal teachers of this dispensation, to ponder and receive additional life. President Harold B. Lee once remarked, What I want to seek for a more clear definition of doctrinal subjects I have usually turned to the writings and sermons of President Joseph F. Smith. Interestingly, when President Smith wanted further light regarding the reach of Christ to the Roman Bill, he turned to the writings of Peter, the chief apostle. These writings, as well as the humble fishermen who offered them, have guided thinking across dispensations, opening the door for soul satisfying answers about redemption from the kingdom of heaven. Paying tribute to Peter, Elder Jeffrey R. 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 once aptly wrote, through the mighty words of the Melchizedek Priesthood, through the mighty work of the Melchizedek Priesthood, that has gone forth to all the world from that day to this, the shadow of Peter is still passing by and healing everyone. Because of his teachings on salvation for the dead, Peter casts a healing shadow through the veil as well. I express my gratitude for the teachings of Peter and have my witness the possibility of salvation in the day as he taught and as his successful student in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
answer your answer questions. Cool, we'll take questions. I don't know if I answer, but we'll take questions. Go ahead. So do you think uh, Joseph Smith and Peter had the understanding that Joseph F. Smith had of what's going on in this prayer book? I think there's evidence that Joseph Smith may have um, from at least the way that the Joseph Smith translation of 1 Peter 4, 6 reads. The idea that it is going on. Now, did, he, did Joseph F. Smith understand it to the extent Joseph F. Smith did? I don't know. But I think there's indication that he clearly believed that something happened in the spirit. Um, Joseph Smith, uh, as many of you know, uh, Joseph Smith is fascinated with the topic of death like his nephew is. Um, Joseph Smith wrote about it a lot. Joseph Smith talked about it. He questioned about it, in part because of the loss of his own children and, and others who he was close. Um, death is a subject that just preoccupied him. He once taught um, if we have if we have claim on our heavenly father for anything, it is for knowledge on this importance. Um, it's a subject that just there's a couple of subjects as I study Joseph Smith that he seems fascinating. One is his life after death, and the other I think is the, is the time and, 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 and coming of the, the return of Christ. The Eventually, that latter one in, in BNC 130, the Lord tells him, "Quit asking me about that subject." As you know, uh, but the other one, he makes these statements where he says. God owes us knowledge on this subject. Um, we, we are ignorant on it. We, we have to know something. And I, so yeah, I'm confident Joseph knew more. Um, did he know as much as he had to? I, I don't know if there's any way to know that. But I think he knew more than, than maybe what we could. I'd, I'd be very confident. And then the, the timing question in this parable, he seems, Joseph F. Smith seems obsessed with that Jesus didn't have enough time to yeah, yeah. Is time, in your understanding of the spirit world, are they on the same timetable as we are? I don't know. Um, you have to think about um, uh, time seems relative to the to the planet, the place where, where, where spirits reside. You think about Abraham and his teachings on time, uh, DNC 130 and his teachings on, on time. Um, and then you want to connect that possibly to Brigham Young's statements on the spirit world being part of this earth experience. But Brigham Young seems to connect spirit world to, to, to this, it's, this, this mortality, like almost as an extension of mortality, that's around us and those kinds of ideas. And that throws open an option for time. I, I've wondered about the same thing. Why, why does Joseph S. Smith feel like, like three days is, is such a barrier for, for someone who's, who can overcome death, who can walk on water, who can raise the dead and heal the sick, and, and, and why does he seem intrigued by the thought that, that three days would have been written? I don't know. It's a great question. Yes? Do you think there's a bit of softening since uh, Joseph Smith and I have thoughts of other churches on this? Accepting more, so it's simply a hard, you know, close on their eating to get more acceptance on the terrible problem. That there's a chance for the I think it depends on who you ask. Um, the, the scholars that I quoted in that part of the paper, um, most of them are modern commentators on the Bible, uh, Ockmeyer and others. These are people who, who are currently writing on the Now, they aren't the heads of their faith. They are simply New Testament scholars um, who continue to struggle with what Peter has taught. Uh, I, I think my answer to that would be, um, the faiths don't seem to be as well masked over the doctrine. And I'm guessing people are more hopefully open to the fire. I, I think many of you would, would, would agree with this. Um, I think there's a lot of people who believe in, in for example, uh, um, the power for families of the Petra Young. Um, there's lots of people who aren't born who just have this thought of feeling, I'm going to be with my spouse, I'm going to be with my children, even though their church doesn't teach them. Even though it's not something that they're that, that doctrinally their faith believes, they personally believe, and I, and I would be comfortable with that. I think that, that there may be people who believe this, even if their churches don't espouse it. That may be an effect of, we, you, you're familiar with teachings, prophetic and otherwise, about the, uh, the spirit of Elijah, and that starting to permeate the earth, genealogical work, stretching around the world, people being intrigued by their ancestors. Malachi has promised, I will, I will send Elijah a prophet. And will turn the hearts of the father's children and the heart of the children of the fathers. Um, that, that spread of the spirit of Elijah may be something that's permeated people. 
if it's not for a native church doctrine. So I think there's people who believe it, even if their faith is teaching. Much like people who believe that my family will be together, even though my faith is teaching. Is that the
so I, I know. So in Peter's vision of the time of Noah. And I'm not sure we're, I'm not sure I'm comfortable saying Peter had a vision of Noah. Does that make sense? Sorry to interrupt you, keep going. But I, we, Peter's text doesn't say it was a vision. He just says this is what Christ did. Um, whether he had been told that by Christ or whether it was a vision, we don't know. We don't know how Peter got his information. Does that make sense? Right. So he just goes back to Noah. Yeah. Joseph F. Smith goes back to Adam. Yeah. And Joseph F. Smith doesn't mention doesn't mention that the Christ ministers to the wicked. Peter goes to Noah and focuses on the wicked among those days. Peter doesn't even mention that he goes to see Noah. It's just he saw the disobedient in Noah. So there's different accounts there. Yes. Peter, I'm sure, wrote more than what we have. Is there any evidence of that revelation? No. Um, there is, there is the, the question, of course, of is what we have, you worded it well, I think, but um, is what we have even in Peter's hand, or is it dictating it? Could Peter have written this as a humble fisherman? Is he dictating it to someone? Can he write by later in his life? Could he write right the Christ story? <coughs> We don't know. Um, I don't know that we know of any evidence. There doesn't, I don't know. I'm, I'm, as you read, as Lindsay read the introduction, um, I tend to do 20th century church history. So that puts me about 19 centuries later than Peter. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't know of any accounts of other Peter type references or other, other things that he's talking Do any of you know of anything else? Well, last night, one of the lecturers was on a podcast. Oh, great. What did he say? Uh, or he or what do you well, he, he pointed out that we really don't have a lot in both the first and second Peter, but then he went through the different topics of writings and more or less said a lot of them lost with the nature and uh, not really analyzed scripture. Uh, some of these are it in different perspectives that may not necessarily be accurate. So you can really write down the topic of writings, but they wouldn't say they're necessarily part authoritative. That's all right. That's not my area of discussion. But thank you. I hope you have a wonderful morning and enjoy the rest of the week.